Okay, here we, here we go. And you know, you don't care. I know you don't care. I'm telling you something extremely important, and I know you don't care. But I'm going to tell you anyway, because we're in a very important part of Scripture. Did I mention this is spiritual rants? And you'll find more than you find out from this podcast at spiritualrants.com. But you will get an overview, which I think can help you quite a bit for the readings for this week, which happens to be week 14. And the readings in the one-year Bible between Deuteronomy 21 and don't go to Deuteronomy 33 yet. Just the end of 32. Then we're going to be in Luke, like 9, the end of 9, and through 12, but not 13. And then some Psalms and Proverbs in Proverbs 12. Did I tell you, this is Jerry Rothhauser, I'm your host, and I'll be your guide to get you through the Bible in a year. And 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 instead of just being confused and reading it and feeling like you're a good person, which you pretty much are if you're reading the Bible for the year, you should have heard the noises I just made while I was clearing my throat. Because this chokes me up that I get so excited about this. Anyway, here's what you're going to learn this week that if you haven't learned it already, it's about prosperity theology. That's what it's called. But if you basically like turn your TV on and remember who is the prince of the power of the air, Uh, He controls most of what's on radio and television and cable, actually. Not everything, but you really have to be careful, know your Bible, and know some theology. And so you turn on the TV and you want something kind of religious. And what you find out is if you give your money to a particular church or particular person, televangelist, whatever, that God will cause you to prosper in the United States of America, the home of prosperity. And by the way, all right, now you got me going. No, you didn't. I got myself going. This whole idea of government and that government's going to take care of you, uh uh-uh. If you look back on your life, you're going to find out government did not take care of you, and it's not going to. Now, things that I talk about in regards to end times, one thing I tell you is Jesus is coming back, and that he's coming back really soon. And really soon, in fact, the apostles thought that Jesus was going to come back in their their lifetime, their lifetimes. And that was like 2,000 years ago. And if you study scripture and you see what it says about the Middle East and Israel in particular, you're going to see that's a hotbed in scripture, and now it's a hotbed now. All kinds of things going on in the Middle East, and in particular, Israel. And so, here's what's going to happen. Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to set up store and everything else. He's going to set up business in Israel, in Jerusalem. Now, that hasn't happened yet. And there's going to be, like, even things getting worse before he does. All right. 
We're going to be out of here before that, I believe. But I'm jumping ahead in all kinds of ways by telling you that, except that what I want to impress you with is one chapter that you're reading this week to go through the Bible for a year is very, very, very important for you to understand Deuteronomy 28. Now, you don't have to spend a lot of time in Deuteronomy 28, because I'm going to explain it to you. But, uh, you know, a, a lot of the Old Testament, a lot of details. But, you know, I've already explained to you what's going on there, especially Genesis through Deuteronomy is the formation of the, the nation Israel and promises made to Abraham. And then we'll find out to David also. And there's, I'll, I'll get into it, I'll tell you. But there are promises made to Israel and they haven't been fulfilled yet. They will, but they're not now. So, here are promises in Deuteronomy 28. This is the watershed chapter for understanding the Old Testament. If you want to understand the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 28 is the place. Not the New Testament, but Deuteronomy 28. Remember I told you Deuteronomy kind of means second law, which means it's a reiteration of everything Moses wrote in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. And now he scrunches, his, scrunches it up in Deuteronomy. And now it's totally scrunched in Deuteron Deuteronomy 28. In Deuteronomy 28, through the whole chapter, there are blessings for obedience to God and curses for disobeying God. Now, don't get your, you know, panties in a wad because this doesn't apply to you. You know, when you do software and you're about ready to install it and then it says apply and then you click apply. This does not apply to you. And so, when those frauds on TV... Um, tell you that it applies to you. They are fraudulent preachers. They are lying to you. Now, is it better to do some of these things in Deuteronomy than other things? Yeah. I mean, you shouldn't commit adultery. I mean, the Ten Commandments, basically, except I already mentioned to you, the Sabbath doesn't apply to you. But all this stuff about animals and sacrifices and wheat and things like that, that, that doesn't apply to you. I mean, chances are, when you're listening to me, you're not a farmer. But everyone who was listening to Moses back in the day, most of them were farmers, except for the religious leaders. And they didn't do a very good job uh, over time. But anyway, here's what Deuteronomy 28.1 says. Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Okay, inserted the word this. So it's not, not important, and ignore that word, this. Because it was this day when he was talking to them and explaining it all, but didn't say that, so anyway, we want to be accurate. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. So all these laws, and you can sort them out, but, you know, it also is best in New Testament times is let Siri read it to you and take a nap. Because a lot of it just doesn't apply to us. 
Deuteronomy 23, blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Because if you obey God, you'll be blessed back in Jewish times, Old Testament times. In fact, when I had to go to um, cemetery, seminary, I'm sorry, I had to take courses on every single book of the Bible before I could graduate with the gradu- which the degree that I received. I had to study every single book in the Bible. And one thing I had to do was write the purpose of the book. And in the Old Testament, I knew that I could get an A if... I would phrase the purpose of the book in this way. I state whatever is in the book, and then I say something about being blessed for whatever that book is about, uh, being blessed of God for obedience, and being cursed for disobedience. That applied to every single book of the Old Testament, but... It's centered all here in Deuteronomy 28. And here in verse 4 even, Blessed blessed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground and of the offspring of your beasts, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Let me see, raise your hand. How many of you were really concerned about your herd and your flock? Well, they did back then. How about um, you're concerned about your kneading bowl? Probably the kneading that you're most concerned of is the cat on your lamp. Or you may need some things, but that's not spelled with a K. But in verse 5, blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Well, they they cared about their basket and their kneading bowl back in that day. Blessed shall be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Okay, I give that one to you. If you're living in an apartment or a tent even, or a house, you're concerned when you leave and you come back. Uh, I'll give that one to you. But if you trust the Lord, he will take care of that anyway. And then read Psalm 121. All right, Deuteronomy 28, 7. The Lord shall cause your enemies to rise up against you, to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way and will flee before you seven ways. It doesn't apply to you. Now, in general, God will take care of you and protect you. But this is about the nation Israel. And, in fact, you look over their history, and when they were obedient to God, their enemies absconded, right? And then they were conquered when they were disobedient. Verse 10, I'm going to skip down. So the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will be afraid of you. That's kind of true now, with that little area smaller than the area of the state of New Jersey, uh, they're still afraid of them. And God still looks out after Israel to a certain extent. You shall lend many nations, verse 12, but you shall not borrow. That doesn't apply to you. If you need a loan for a mortgage, you you can take it out. <laughs> Then, in verse 13, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You ever hear televangelists talk about that? And you only will be above, and you will not be underneath, if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I charge you today to observe them carefully. This is part of an address from Moses to the nation of Israel. Verse 14, do not turn aside from any of the words which I command you today to the right or to the left to go after other gods to to serve them. Then 
That was a segue in his sermon to the Jews where he gets into the curses. But it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe, to, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which statutes, which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. You'll be cursed in the city. You'll be cursed in the country. And there's your basket in the next verse and your kneading bowl mentioned again. And your herds and your flock, the next verse. And then your prayers won't be heard because the heaven which over your head shall be bronze and the earth which is under you iron. God's not going to listen to your prayers. But, you know, that's generally true in the Bible anyway. I mean, if you break fellowship with him, he's not going to answer your prayers the way you want or the way he wants. And then, you know, there's just grossities in here, too. Verse 30, here's a curse. You shall betroth a wife, but another man will violate her. You shall build a house, but you will not live in it. You shall plant, plant a vineyard, and you will not use its fruit. So all of this is, and then it goes on to talk about oxes and about your sons and daughters and et cetera. And it's all curses that accrue to their account when they're disobedient as a nation. Now, that obedience isn't just rote. Uh, that's based on their faith in God. It's always faith. From once we got kicked out of paradise until Jesus comes back and sets up shop in the millennium, it's all by faith. And this all, you know, this is all applied to Israel when they were disobedient. You shall become a horror, a proverb, and a taunt among all the people where the Lord drives you. And they're going to be scattered. And they're promised that in this portion of Scripture. The Lord will drive all of them out. They weren't in the region called Israel over in the Middle East for a long time. Because they were disobedient. And they went into captivity. So we'll get all to, we'll get to that, you know, as we get through the Bible, but this all ends up being true for the nation of Israel. And this is all about the nation of Israel. If they were true to God, he'd take care of them and these and the promises they'd be blessed. And if they're disobedient, and that'll happen to you. I mean, you'll be a ruin if you don't trust God and read the New Testament, and follow what it says. Primarily, last week I gave you four commands, right? You remember that? Do not quench, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, do not, or actually you should be led by the Spirit by being filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. That is what is demanded of Christians in this day. So verse 46 of Deuteronomy 28, They shall become a sign and a wonder on you and your descendants forever. In other words, everyone would know that they're cursed. And let's see. Deuteronomy 28, 58, as we work our way through the chapter, he will bring back in, well, verse 60, he will bring back on you all the diseases, diseases of Egypt, which you were afraid, and they will cling to you. Also, every sickness and every plague, which not written in the book of this law, the Lord will bring on you until you are destroyed. 
you know, they don't want that. And here, here it is, right here, right here, right here on our stage, verse 64. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples. This was written thousands of years before World War II. And even before that, Shakespeare's time, Shakespeare wrote about Jews. And they have been scattered already. The Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. And there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, which you or your fathers have not known. Now, has that happened to like people now? Are they scattered? Who's scattered? The Jews are scattered. Of course, Christians are scattered. But the Jews are scattered. Now, I've already told you multiple times, here I'm scolding you, that Colossians 3.24 applies, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. It's the Lord whom you serve. So that's true in New Testament times. And then also, Uh, It is the guardian and the schoolmaster for us, like a couple of verses down from there in Colossians 3. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 11, these things happen to them as, in the King James, an ensample, that's what it says, an ensample, but in a contemporary version, it says, it's all examples, it's illustrations of the truths in the New Testament. That's, it's pretty tedious, some of the laws, but some of the stores, stories are pretty cool. And, of course, we're going to get into that again next week when we get into Book of Joshua, some cool stories. And you already got, I mean, you got Babel, you got the Flood, you got Abraham and his wife uh, and how he give, gave over his wife to kings in that time. And we're going to learn about David and about Jeremiah and Daniel. Anyway, all of that is good for us to know. And Moses, of course, and the Red Sea and slavery and all of that is good for us to know so that we understand better the spiritual things in the New Testament. And when we are blessed in the New Testament times, it's spiritually it's not so that you can get like more diamonds and a bigger car and live in a mansion. What you have to look forward to, maybe, is some pretty cool digs. And the way you might dress yourself at that time. Of course, it may just be in light, like really bright light. But I'll, I'll mention that again in a few minutes. But in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, these things happen to us as an example in the Old Testament. They were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. That's us. The end of the ages is coming to us. Now, here in the New Testament, let me explain salvation to you. It's not following the laws in the Old Testament and being careful about being blessed and cursed. This is salvation in the New Testament. It's in three tenses. Remember in grammar school, you learned verbs, and verbs came in tenses? And three is the number of tenses, basically. And there were, you know, alterations on on those, but basically three. And that is an explanation of the way the Bible uses the term save and saved and will serve and will will save. So here's one, Titus 3, five. He saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. So it's by grace, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So Titus 3.5 tells us that in the past, when we have already trusted Christ, that was in the past. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you have been saved 
Those were the Ephesians had already been saved that were reading that letter. Through faith, and that not of yourselves, it was a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. So that was in the past for them. For the readers of Titus, it was in the past. And if you've already trusted Christ, that's in the past. John 3.17, not 3.16 that you see in football games all the time. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved in the past through him. In the present, we're supposed to be disciples. Now, if we're not disciples, we're not serious about our Christianity, do you st still go to heaven? Well, I think the indication is, yeah, you will. You just will lose out in the afterlife. Because that's really what we're working for, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not getting into that more deeply than that, let me give you a, th a few verses about being saved in the present, which maybe have confused you when you've read them before. First Timothy 4.16, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching, persevere, that's now, and, and continuously is what you're supposed to do, persevere now in these things, not to be saved and go to heaven, but to be saved and become more like Christ-like more like Christ, and you'll rack up things at the Bema seat, but I don't want to get into that. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. So it's now we should be evangelizing and persevering, becoming more like Christ. James 1 21, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, because that doesn't make sense for Christians, in humility, receive the word implanted, study the Bible, which is able to save your souls, which means now, it's saving you now. So, here's an illustration. I go in and I get a latte. And they say, that's $15.23. No, they don't. <laughs> Almost. $4.58. They say, that's the price for the latte. And here's what they say. They say, it will be $4.58. And inevitably, because I think it's funny, I say to them, really? It will be? What would it cost me if I get it right now? And they look confused, but I'm tickled. Anyway, you get the idea. Meaning, what we're doing now will save us, which is now. The same as the price of that latte, or I don't, I don't get the latte. Philippians 2.12 my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, that doesn't mean that you're supposed to work at being a Christian so that someday maybe you'll make it and it's past fail. That is heresy. If you ever hear tell, someone tell you that, it's heresy. Verse 13 of Philippians 2, it is God who has work, who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now that's how we are being saved. Now, James 5.20, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And we do that because they will be saved, and we're being saved as we do it. Here in the future, this is when we go to heaven. This is the third tense of salvation. Much more than Romans 5, 9, 
having now been justified by his blood, which happened in the past, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. That happens in the future. Verse 10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's a future tense. And then we'll be changed, get a new body, a new environment, be right with Jesus. I mean, right there with Jesus. Romans 13, 11. It says, now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. That is heaven. 1 Corinthians 3, 15. He himself will be saved yet as through fire. That's future. Now, I'm telling you the truth. You can look it up like the Bereans. There are some that are just lying to you about prosperity and life here on earth, and they're not telling you the truth. They may even hold up the Bible up in the air and say, is is this what we believe? Yeah, okay, then how come you're not teaching it then? Teach us a little something. 2 Corinthians 2.17 says, We are not like many peddling the word of God. In other words, just making money off of it. Which, by the way, I'm not making anything on any of this. But I'd rather just tell you the truth than make money. As from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Here's a verse which doesn't use the word saved but it uses the word deliver. And it's in three tenses. Second Corinthians 1.10, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, that's when we trusted Christ, and will deliver us on whom we have set our hope, that's heaven, and he will yet deliver us. He's delivering us now from sin. That's now. So three tenses. All right, now we got to... <laughs> Really wrap through and finish it up, Deuteronomy, and then get to the New Testament. Captive wives, there's rules in chapter 21, you can read that. The Jews even took care of people that they had to subdue and capture, and the wives, the women. And there's a chapter on that. There is a chapter on virgins in Deuteronomy 22, which has like no application, I guess, for current times. That's a out, an outdated concept, virgins. But since I have a bunch of this and not a bunch of time, I'm just going to tell you this, that there were rules about being a virgin back then, and the father would in, enforce it if anyone would lie about that. There was proof, and you can read that. And one interesting thing is, like, uh, in this day and age, if you're, like, just living with someone and not getting married, you can see God wants you to get married. He wants families. And proof of that is if a guy takes a girl, I think I, I think I know you, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, um, he was supposed to marry her. That's like, um, well, you can find it. It's like verse 19, um, verse 28. No, it's 28. It's not 19 in 22. And then... You're not supposed to charge exorbitant interest in Deuteronomy 23, credit card companies. That's the ruin of our economy right now. Don't put anything on a, a charge card if, if you can avoid it at all. Don't do it. They will take you. They will change the rules in midstream. Trust me, I know. Divorce is covered. God didn't like divorce. He said that. 
outright in Malachi. We'll get there. But in 24, talks about that. And then fathers won't be responsible if their sons are, you know, drips and sloths and anyway, vice versa. Sons are not responsible for fathers, Deuteronomy 24. What's the word I'm looking for? It's like people who don't pay their debts. Anyway, Deuteronomy 25, you shall not muzzle the ox while he's threshing, which means let him eat if he's working. And that's applied to pastors, believe it or not, in 1 Corinthians 9, 9, 1 Timothy 5, 18. A direct quote of that from Old Testament, Paul using that principle to... uh, Use that in regards to pastors. Dead beats just came to me. Dead beats. <laughs> Fathers are not responsible for sons that are dead beats and vice versa. But also, churches are not supposed to be dead beats in regard to their pastors. And yet, how many pastors are just poor? Well, Deuteronomy 26. And then some are too rich. But at any rate, Deuteronomy 26 talks about a third tithe. So let me get through that really, really quick. There is no such thing as a 10% tithe. And so when a church tells you you need to give a tenth, that's probably because it's a deadbeat church that isn't paying the pastors, but... That's not a way to solve the problem. There were three tithes in the Old Testament. This was the third one, and it was only every third year. So on average, if you have three tithes, it comes to 23 and a third percent, right? Now, in the New Testament, if you had two coats, how many were you supposed to give away? That's 50%. And then the widow whom Jesus observed, how much did she put in? A hundred percent. So that gets you grace to grace giving in Second Corinthians 8 and 19. All right, observe everything in the, in the law, Deuteronomy 28, 58. And this is cool. In 29, 5 of Deuteronomy Moses had led them for 40 years in the wilderness, but their clothes had not worn out and their sandal had not worn out on your foot. So you didn't have planned obsessance. Is that what it's called? You know what I'm talking about. Like we had in the 70s with the car industry. They built them to wear out. (laughs) And so then all of us drive Japanese cars now. Cars now. All right. 29.29 of Deuteronomy. Obsessance. Obsolescence. Is that it? The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. Meaning that your Bible is a revelation to us from God of things we wouldn't understand. And so we need to go to Barnes & Noble or wherever, buy Bibles and read them, understand it. I use a verse for my devotion every day when you go to spiritualrants.com. The devotion verse or verses are called Choose Life. Because in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, Moses says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. And the reason we don't have bumper music on this podcast is because I never got uh, p- permission from Debbie Boone for Choose Life. So Debbie, if you're if you're listening, give me permission. I'll put your song on there. She did this great song called Choose Life, and it's from Deuteronomy thirty point or thirty 
verse 19. And the whole deal in in the Bible is that we have to choose life. If we want it, do what God wants us to do. If we don't do what God wants us to do, then we suffer the consequences. And that's true spiritually in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it was materially. We're going to hear this a lot. Deuteronomy 31.7, this was a good song by Michael W. Smith way back when. Moses called to Joshua and said to him in the sight of Israel, Be strong and courageous. And God is telling us today, even that that's Old Testament, but spiritually is still applicable. Then the rock is mentioned in Deuteronomy 32, 18, and 30. That's not the actor. It's Jesus. And we should have no God beside us. Deuteronomy 32, 39. New Testament. We're out of time. Just kidding. But we're going to rip through it. Last week, did I mention Luke 9, 23, the key verse on discipleship in the New Testament? Jesus was saying to everyone that was listening to him at the time, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You know what that is? That's that's suffering. That's what those guys, the fraudulent pastors on TV, don't talk about for the most part. Or they don't talk about it in the right way. That's That's part of... Being a Christian is that there's suffering now. There's blessing. And I don't want to overemphasize the, um, that aspect of the Christian life. But it's part of the second tense. So the first tense is we are saved. We're being saved. That's discipleship. And then we will be saved. And that being saved, I don't know if I mentioned also in Luke 9, last podcast, there was the transfiguration there, and Jesus was showing Peter and John what the millennium was going to be like. He said, right before that, there's going to be some of you that get to see what this is. And the sum was like Jesus and and P- or was Peter and John, and then they got to see Moses and Elijah. Moses was the beginning of the nation of Israel in the sense of the law, and Elijah pretty much the end of Israel. And they were both there at the millennium, and then that cool hilltop experience was over. So then we get to this week, allow the dead to bury their own dead. And when I was first saved, I can't believe I did this. I said this to the uh, professor who was the mentor for our group on campus at Butler, uh, Sweet 16 this year. Anyway, I applied this to some of the people at that um, fellowship. And boy, it made him mad. But On the other hand, we had a lot of people, kids that were in college that had been to college, I mean, been to church. I really hadn't been to the right kind of church growing up. And there were just church, church, church churchy, church anity people uh, that were involved there. uh, And proof that several of them went into mainstream uh, denominations and kind of were dead spiritually. Anyway, Jesus sent out the 70 in Luke 10, and that was to proclaim that he was willing to set up the millennium right then. But they were all rejected. Jesus was rejected in a big way, Um, the crucifixion, right? And then, if you're wondering, there are degrees of punishment in hell. So some people tell me, well, they're a good person. Well, that's good. That will get you to the higher levels of hell. And Jesus said in Luke ten twelve, I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. 
which is talking about hell. So when Dante put together his comedy, quote unquote, um, he was right. Woe to you, Corazine. Woe to you, Bethesda. Sound like mouth rinses, don't they? And the miracles that were performed in Tyre and Sidon, if they had occurred in you, they would have repented long ago. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon. So degrees of punishment in hell. Luke ten twenty seven. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and neighbor as yourself. Uh, that's quoting Deuteronomy. We covered that last week in the podcast, Deuteronomy 6, 5. And then treating your neighbors as yourself is in Leviticus nineteen eighteen. And then um, your fathers, Deuteronomy ten twenty two. your fathers went down to Egypt 70 persons. And now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. So we see the blessing on Israel that we just covered. They will be as numerous as the stars of heaven in that they were obedient. And 70 persons, same as Jesus sent out, um, that's how many in the family of Abraham ended up in Egypt. And then they became numerous. Deuteronomy 10.22. But in Luke 10, 41-42, the story of Martha and Mary. So if you're like me, OCD, that's not good. Uh, I was told by one of the pastors at First Baptist Atlanta before I left for seminary, he said, don't forget to smell the roses, which is what Jesus said to Martha in essence. And then I preached a sermon on this about Martha and Mary, because Jesus said, chill like Mary is chilling. There's one thing that you need to f find out, which was Jesus. And then there's a movie called City Slicker. So I mentioned that when I was preaching years and years ago in Fort Worth. And I got criticized um, because I quoted uh, an R-rated movie, which was City Slickers, which was uh, actually a PG-13. It wasn't an R. And today, it'd probably be a G. But that's an interesting book because Billy Crystal is looking for one thing. He didn't find it. It's Jesus. Luke 11 has the Lord's Prayer, which is really the disciples' prayer, if you think about it, because he didn't need to pray it. The disciples needed to pray it. But you find that in the Sermon on the Mount, in like Matthew 6 and 7, and you're going to find stuff from Luke 11 and 12 in the Sermon in the Mount. But... One thing is not in the Sermon on the Mount is a, a cool story about persistence in prayer. And so you should read it around verse 5. And the, the, the cool word that should be associated with that parable is importunity. Got it? Importunity. Look it up. Ask, seek, and knock. That's in Luke 11, but it's also in the Sermon on the Mount. And I just saw an ad for Illinois, and it showed uh, this guy who is a Lincoln impersonator. If you go to Springfield, Illinois, you'll get to see him. I haven't been there, but he's been here in Fishers, Indiana, and he's cool. And he's in that ad. And so he, maybe as an impersonator, he says something like this. Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. You may have thought Lincoln said that. Jesus said that first. All right. Um, someone said to Jesus in Luke eleven twenty seven, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. And Jesus said, Nah, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. So even Jesus' immediate family 
isn't as blessed as those of us who read the Bible. Luke 11:42, I know what you're going to say to me, well, talks about tithing. Oh, you said tithing wasn't in the New Testament. Well, uh, Gospels are Old testament and that tithe um, really would be 23 and a third anyway. And, and so what I said still applies. Luke 11.45, Jesus calls out lawyers. That's cool. And uh, the teacher, the, the lawyer says to Jesus, teacher, when you say whatever Jesus was saying, then you insult us too. Cool. <laughs> and the lawyer there doesn't mean like he, he knows American government. It, it meant he studied the law of Moses. And so in chapter 12, Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. That meant the legalism. And leaven is what causes bread to puff up and expand. That's what leaven is for in bread. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. It was spreading religion, which is legalism. Actually, the Bible is faith and grace. The unforgivable sin is in Luke twelve ten, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I've explained that already in the past. But the un- unforgivable sin, in essence, is you don't trust Christ. Then you go to hell. That's really what it is. Technically speaking, you can't commit that sin because you talk you talk about the Holy Spirit means you don't believe the miracles that Jesus did to prove to people that he was God. And greed occurs in the end times, Luke twelve, fifteen. Do we see much greed today? God said to people who are just living for today and storing up a bunch of stuff, you fool. And and I'll tell you about Proverbs because I'm not going to go through much in Proverbs for your readings because it was written Solomon to his son, which is wisdom for all of us. But those who don't follow it, and you'll find the word fool in your reading in Proverbs 12 this week, that's people who don't trust the Lord. And uh, there's a description of end times. You'll find that when Jesus comes in the end times, it'll be like a thief for a thief in the night. Now, for the church, he's like a bridegroom coming for the church. A thief is the way Jesus will come to people who aren't penny, paying any attention to what's going on in the world and don't trust Christ and what the scripture says about him. Luke twelve fifty one, Jesus promises that he would bring division. Huh? Yeah, that's what it says. And Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. So when you trust the Lord, um, people may get mad at you. That's what it means. And in the end of Luke 12, 54, you can be a weather man or a weather woman and don't understand that the end times are on you, even though you can tell what the weather is for tomorrow. So you know the future for the next day, but you don't get it that the Lord's coming back. That's what he was saying. Anyway... If you feel rejected by God, read Psalm 74. It's one of those laments I talk about. Um, You want to get promoted? Read Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7. It's not from your boss. The promotion comes from God. Read that. Psalm 76 is about Jerusalem. It's one of those psalms that falls in that category about Jerusalem 77 verse 5 and 6 is really cool read that and then do a search for the idiot rule in my blogs the idiot rule is you get mad at God you get mad at God he's not doing what you think he should do blah 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 includes me and 
then when the smoke clears, you find out that he was really with you the whole time. And then read 5 and 6 of Psalm 77. Psalm 78 is a historical and and hysterical. Historical. I'm hysterical. It is historical. But you're supposed to put A-N, right, in, in, in front of a H a lot of the time. And historical song. Because it's got lots of the history of Israel in it. And you'll enjoy that. And it's long. So you're not even going to finish the whole thing this week. But we'll be back next week with week 15 of the One Year Bible. This is Jerry Rothhauser. Check out more in my blogs, spiritualrants.com. And of course, the podcast, as you probably know, is found on Libsyn, but it's also in iTunes and YouTube and Google Play. Tell your friends. I will. See you next week. Bye.